Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. And uh, uh, welcome to what's new in the SQL Server tools here at the PASS Virtual Summit uh, 2020. Um, uh, my name is Vicki Harp. I'm the Group PM Manager for the SQL Server Tools and Experiences team at Microsoft. Hi, folks, and I'm Ken Van Heining. I'm the Group Engineering Manager for a lot of the same things around SQL tools, drivers, and actually now just took on a bit of a new role with uh, also helping out on some of the release engineering things for SQL. So I'll get to do some new things there and bring some of our great tooling uh, efforts that we've been there to some of the internal tools our teams need. So all those CUs, all the Azure trains, stuff like that. So a lot of new fun things going there where the tools team is gonna get to help out too. Hi everyone, my name is Alan Yu. I'm a program manager on the same team and I'm just here as a moderator. We'll be engaging with all of you through the chat and we'll also take some of your questions and ask Vicky and Ken to answer them. So I'm just here to help. Now, uh, organizationally, uh, since this is uh, remote, what we're going to be doing is uh, if you ask questions, uh, Alan, if he's able to answer them, we'll answer them in the chat as we go. And he'll also be noting and flagging some to, to repeat to us at the end or to hold to the end, uh, at which point uh, uh, Ken and I will answer them live. If anything comes up that's really deeply confusing in the course of it, uh, Alan will also be interrupting us to ask us questions as we go. But for the most part, we'll be uh, going through the main presentation and the demos and then doing questions at the end. So uh, what we're gonna be covering today is the uh, SQL Server tools. Uh, and so what I wanted to start with uh, was this diagram that I've come up with uh, that I've used at a couple of conferences now, you might, might have seen it before, to kind of explain what we're talking about when we're talking about SQL Server experiences. So to, to read this chart, you can think of it like, you know, uh, onion uh, layers, going from the very center being SQL Server engine and then building out from there. And one of the things that's really critical to, to understand about this is that each of these outer level and upper level interfaces relies in some portion on the lower level interfaces. Maybe not a direct stack of requiring every single thing, but you do not get to graphical interfaces without having done the, the CLI scripting drivers libraries and all the way down to the engine. And so when we're talking about uh, SQL Server experiences, I think to external users, a lot of times the expectation is that we're talking about these graphical interfaces um, and the ones that you interact with on a daily basis, Azure Portal, SSMS, Azure Data Studio, uh, the developer experiences in uh, Visual Studio and VS Code, um, migration experiences in SSMA, et cetera. But those are all built on this important underpinning of uh, deeper experiences having to do with programmability, having to do with uh, connectivity, having to do with uh, scriptability. Uh, and in fact, we essentially use our own tools uh, from the lower in the stack to build the tools that are upper in the stack. So today I wanna go over some of uh, what's happening across that entire stack, uh, starting from the inner layers and building out to the outer layers uh, to kind of give you a perspective on uh, how we're viewing the, the motion for SQL Server experiences all up. And one of the things that I want to mention here is that increasingly the SQL Server experiences team is more than just SQL Server. Um, and it's more than just user experiences. Like uh, Ken said, we're actually branching very strongly into the internal Microsoft experiences for how to build and release, how to support, uh, et cetera. And we're also getting into more of an Azure data uh, experience where we have Azure Data Studio that has increasing numbers of cross-platform, cross-service uh, support, uh, and even getting into multi-cloud, poly-cloud, Azure Arc, all of these different deployment techniques. And so in the experiences team, we're having to react to some of those platform changes, things like Azure Arc coming into the picture. And we're also having to anticipate and prepare for them. So we're having to say, uh, whenever a new platform feature lands, we need to have some sort of coherent story for how users might interact with that. We need to know where developers would go, where, where administrators would go, where business users might go uh, in the stack of these experiences. So uh, the sense, any external sense that there might be that we have competition amongst these experiences, uh, we should put that aside. All of these experiences are funded and supported and worked on because they serve an important role. Uh, Sometimes externally you hear things about SSMS versus Azure Data Studio. And internally I can say it's not that sort of versus experience. It's, it's more of a, what's the position of SSMS? What's the position of Azure Data Studio? What's the position of the Azure portal? 
who are those experiences for? What are we building for? So Ken, do you have any, any commentary on any of that? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I'd, I'd throw out is uh, the, the taxonomy here is, is it's, it's elegantly simple when you look at it. But before we had this, and this is one of the things that's been great having Vicki join the team, is she's really been great about breaking down some of these topics that we talk about into a frame that empowers us to drive a strategy and work across a vast number of teams in Azure data. And like one of my uh, favorite examples is recently the SQL assessment work done by not only a different team than our direct team, but actually a team that's uh, significantly in a significantly different time zone. And so we were able to work with them to show them the structure, how we think about extending the portfolio and how we see empowering different users and different use cases by working working at different levels of the stack. And that's opened up the ability to be able to have a common set of IP that then could power not only automation through things like PowerShell commandlets that do the assessment, but also building rich UI that has been shown up in SSMS and now also some support in Azure Data Studio. And it's even parlaying now into being able to take some of that core IP and help with things like migration assessments by using the same core engine. And that this, this type of structure enables us to be able to focus on those strategic directions and alignments across a, a wide array of teams and still drive a co cohesive portfolio. And then also just, you know, as the, on the engineering and technical side, uh, I can tell you my boss for sure likes to be able to make sure that we're have fun, uh, following clear fundamentals at each level, because you can imagine being able to test at the core driver or API level is a certain type of testing and a certain type of rigor. And then there's more of an aesthetic or artistic side that needs to be in, uh, done at the higher levels. And then, I don't know, I throw in one more thing I think that's um, about this space. The other thing that's really revolutionized the way that we even talk about some of the top level of the stack, because as Vicky said, usually people think of it's just pixels or GUI that we want to talk about. And there really isn't. There's a whole stack here that empowers a lot of use cases. And adding notebooks in there is, how long has it been, Vicky? About a year, really? Something right around there, I think. It's, it was Ignite 2018 that we had our first notebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and that's completely also, also completely changed the way we can engage with the team and enables us to have a, shall we say, better than just a CLI experience, but have a, a kind of a hybrid uh, GUI experience where they can perfect APIs and make things work and get those stables stable while we go and invest in things like you as your experience research and getting those graphical experiences, right? Because those experiences are much harder to test. They also have a lot of costs for us around accessibility things for us to get those right for all the customers we want to support. And so by doing that, it allows us to work with teams in parallel much, much sooner. They can get out, customers can start to learn what's going on with the system. And then we can start to work on which of those experiences really need a rich, more integrated experience. So I really loved the frame. It's helped talk about the portfolio and it really talks a lot about the strategy and the way that we think about some of these things and how they work together. And I think another way for, uh, especially for external users to take a look at this, because this is, this is something that we use internally to communicate within our team, but also externally to understand the rate of change across these is very different. So at the graphical interface level, you have such a wide set of experiences from deeper down that need to be brought up to the graphical layer, that you could have these things popping just about every month new features and new usability considerations, new accessibility, these things pop pretty quick. Notebooks can also move pretty quick. Down at the deeper levels, you get slower moving, more important changes. So when you make a change to PowerShell, when you make a change to CLI, um, it's often aligned with more you know, tectonic shifts, if you can think about it. And down at the driver and library level, these are things where uh, by adding something to a driver, you're you're adding it to an entire set of you know programming experiences. The the amount of testing that needs to go into that is very great. And when it's a net new feature, uh, a lot of times those things are going to be aligned with new releases of SQL Server, which is of course the the base level of the stack here where we're talking about changes, not just to SQL uh, on prem, you know the 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 you know versioned SQL, but also the continuous updates in Azure SQL, uh, where 
when those things make a change, there's a lot of pre-work that has to happen across drivers, libraries, scripting, et cetera, before that's brought out to the public. And so sometimes it'll feel like maybe there's been a long period of no activity there. It may actually uh, reflect the fact that the activity is aligned with SQL engine changes and it's all going to come out kind of in a big package. That's so when you get a CTP, all of the messaging is around the SQL server, new uh, experiences you know, in, in the engine, but the driver's library scripting CLI will often kind of pop out at the same time. Whereas the notebooks and the graphical interfaces can kind of go on continuously to say, we're going to keep improving that, et cetera, um, from, from month to month. So the way that we're gonna work through this is we're gonna just kind of step through each of these levels. And so uh, to start with, we'll uh, go with the drivers and libraries. So examples of, of drivers and libraries, we have um, at the driver level, uh, kind of our primary drivers are SQL client for .NET, uh, JDBC for Java, ODBC, which is kind of across a whole big stack of languages um, and which is actually the base driver on which a lot of other experiences are built. Uh, OLADB, which is a little bit more of a, a I guess a, an older, I, I, I hesitate to say legacy in that we actually absolutely still support it, but uh, it's an older driver. Uh, PyODBC for Python, PHP, uh, TDS, which is the Node.js driver, and uh, I have Go listed here, and we've actually also recently been working with Django. So th this, this is a set of experiences that I think a lot of people don't think a lot about, but you absolutely feel it if you need something there and it's not there. And so that's one of the things that uh, it, most of these drivers release uh, one to four times a year, some of them more often. And uh, there's a lot uh, of to be con covered there. Uh, you know, should we ever want to get into details on it, but just I kind of want to tell you that it exists. And then we have SMO and DECFX. So um, in, in talking about uh, the SMO and DACFX, these are the libraries, like the programming libraries that our team maintains on which a lot of other things are built. And Ken, do you want to kind of talk about that from an engineering standpoint? Uh, sure, yeah. So I think, um, and this goes, actually talks back on the frame slightly too. The, the thing historically we never really did before thinking of the, the portfolio this way is really a lot of these runtimes weren't treated as first class citizens uh, across what we would ship. Uh, I know for years, many people would take SMO or other uh, pieces of SSMS or the tool setup that used to be in SQL and take some of those uh, uh, assemblies and use them in other applications. And so we, we see a great value in these APIs and, and we've kept it really to the two sets with SMO mostly being around your management APIs and then our developer APIs are more where we're at uh, with DACFX. And so folks that use those are probably uh, very familiar with the differences between them. Uh, SMO, we've continued to extend just because the surface area of SQL Server is continuing to extend vastly. But that is the, the API that uh, you'll now see. It has a NuGet uh, package. I, most of you, uh, if you have been working, have probably worked with David uh, Shiflet, who is the uh, core engineer behind shipping that. And we do it. Uh, roughly three to four times a year, we try to get an update out on the NuGet feed for that. Similarly for DACFX, again, we try to do three to four releases a year. It doesn't, it really kind of depends on what's going on on a given uh, semester and the backlog there, but we have the whole, uh, there's actually several engineers also on the DACFX team internally. DACFX actually powers a ton of uh, scenarios internally for us now. Uh, not only is it used by several of the tools like uh, the Visual Studio database projects, um, it's now being shipped as part of ADS for our cross-platform support for developer tools. I think Vicky's going to talk a little more about some of those capabilities. Um, and then internally in Azure, it's used by the import-export service, if you're ever importing and exporting your database uh, with that. But we actually use it internally in Azure for updating the central metadata, meta, metadata store for all the cluster information. And they actually use DACFX to be able to get the same type of scripting and uh, support for doing database upgrades uh, for the service. So DACFX, very important API for us. And so we continue to invest in that. We love, uh, we've talked about a roadmap there, which someday I still, I know some of you are, are going to say that I'm, I sound like somewhat of a broken record, but we really do have 
have plans to get those things moved out to open source eventually. Uh, you know, we just constantly struggle with other fire drills and other projects that we have to, to keep funding. But it is something we've been making slow incremental progress on the internals around cleaning up the code bases and things. But those are absolutely very much first class citizens now. And I think uh, you'll continue to see us ship those and continue to see the make those as APIs that you can also build applications on just like the ADS and SSMS because in the end those really are, although very uh, ad admin and developer centric apps, they're very much just applications that talk to the data platform. So uh, the only other thing I wanted to add here is that I don't have as such a list of updates to give on things that have changed in the last year here. There have been a lot of updates, but a lot of them are, are really fine grain changes. Uh, probably the most uh, visible one actually wasn't something that happened this year, it happened the year before, which is in the driver's uh, area, we switched from the traditional system.data.sql client driver to Microsoft.data.sql client. Now, so if you are a .NET developer and you're listening to this and you're hearing me say that and say, I don't know what that means, you should go and look that up. I have a number of blog posts about it. I have uh, some uh, presentations on channel nine about it. Uh, essentially, we have started uh, releasing updates to the .NET driver more frequently on our own cadence, separate from the updates to the .NET framework. And in order to do that, we've moved it out into a new assembly, which is uh, Microsoft.data.sql client instead of system.data.sql client. Your system.data.sql client will continue to work, but it's not going to be getting the new features. Uh, for example, uh, the always encrypted with enclave support uh, and uh, data classification type support going into new versions of SQL Server, more contemporary uh, Azure SQL functionality will be landing in that other driver. So, hey, Vicki, real quick on that. I yeah. just want to really echo that, especially if you're looking at modernizing an application that you want to do, go to cross platform, that's that's the obvious uh, uh, choice there. And we're doing continuing to invest on that driver to remove uh, even for Windows, the old dependency on the native SNI DLL. So that's work that we think is super important. And then as Vicky was mentioning, new authentication, support for new platform features is all going in there. All the new performance work is gonna go there. Uh, so definitely if you're looking at modernizing an application, then you definitely wanna look into that driver. Mm -hmm. So moving up to the next layer in the stack, we have the CLI and scripting. And in some cases, these interfaces are really thin shims on top of the drivers and the libraries that we just mentioned. So uh, at the Microsoft Hackathon this summer, I actually worked on SQL package. I took my tr tried my hand at a couple of days of development work after a couple of years of not doing that. And I, I came to, yes, and Ken's like, yeah. Uh, I came to really understand how much SQL package is a shim over DACFX. And I also have a much better understanding of why it's not going to be just a turnkey, let's open source this uh, issue. That's quite quite a code base there. Um, and But essentially, SQL package uh, as an executable, it's a you know it's a tool that allows you to run DACFX command at the command line, but it's really a thin shim of like here's something that can take input, clean it up for you, and then pass it to that library. Uh, and I wouldn't say PowerShell is that same level of closeness, but it's not far. It's again PowerShell is largely doing calls down to SMO, uh, and then you have SQL CMD, which is actually built as part of the drivers. It's it's very tightly connected, and so. Uh, with the command line tools, we have, uh, you know, kind of a, an increasing number of them. It's just a matter of SQL CMD and BCP have been around for a long time. MS SQL CLI, which came out uh, for GA last year, uh, is uh, a Python based, you know, better interactivity uh, kind of command line tool. One of the things that we've been running into with this is uh, with the increasing number of them, people are not finding them and they're not knowing how to get a hold of them. So I wanted to mention here that one of the things that we're going to be looking into and I've been promising this for a while, but it, it really is coming, is a SQL tools package, which will be a package that will pull together what we consider kind of the base set of command line and graphical tools, uh, at least for Windows, and then we'll probably move over to cross-platform as well to help people identify and get to these command line tools a little bit more easily. Uh, over on the scripting side, PowerShell, uh, I just kind of want to call out that uh, as of this month, we have 11.9 million installations of the PowerShell uh, SQL Server library uh, uh, module from the PowerShell gallery. Uh, and so, and this is really kind of a labor of love for the engineers on our team that work on it. And some of the people 
uh, inside and outside of Microsoft who are really champions of, of these users. We really thank you for your, your feedback on this. Uh, this is a, an area, again, that keeps coming up. Should we open source it, et cetera? And uh, it, I'll just kind of go again. Yes, uh, I, I think it, it's just more or less the open sourcing something is a little bit more complex than just saying, here's the source, go with it. We have to make it where you can build it. And the build dependencies for these things, and this is what I'm coming to understand, sort of assume that you're building within Microsoft and you have access to all of these tools and all of this code and, and all of these uh, pipelines that uh, lifting them up and putting them external so that people can actually make changes to it and commit it back and it goes into the program uh, is uh, not as simple as just lift and shift. And But uh, that is kind of directionally I think where we want to go, PowerShell remains really important. And now with notebooks uh, supporting PowerShell, uh, we really anticipate that this isn't something that's that's on the descent. It's not like we're now we're all interested in Python and not PowerShell anymore. This is really you know here to stay and going to continue to be important. So, Ken, anything else before I move on to notebooks? Um, no, not too much. I mean, other than uh, maybe in the comments or questions, uh, or if uh, I don't think we have a, a poll thing, but I would be curious how many folks have actually either looked at or tried MS equals CLI. Uh, for us, it was one of those things that we thought fit the strategy of the portfolio really well, but it did come along with a Python dependency. And so we're very curious because we just really haven't seen the uptake on it that we would have um, expected or really kind of hoped for because it's a really, I think an exciting interactive shell. And I think we uh, was only, it was May, I think that we shipped the uh, kind of update that had some horizontal paging support for Linux and some other uh, uh, improvements. I think that's where batch uh, uh, file support came into. If I recall correctly, it might be off a little bit, but uh, anyway, it, it's just one of those tools where uh, I'm just surprised given the number, uh, it just doesn't even compare still to some of the other tools. And so if you have any thoughts or feedback, maybe Alan can be taking a look at that during the time if there's any questions, or maybe people still just haven't heard about it and we need to do more. And maybe uh, as Vicki said, the SQL tools package will help with some discoverability things. Uh, but it is, it's one of those where we were really excited when we were working on it and, and getting it out and demoing it. I think we demoed it quite a bit uh, a year or so ago, or uh, a year and a half ago. And, and so anyway, uh, that was just, uh, if you have anything there, that'd probably great to, to share some of that. Yeah, I agree. MS equals CLI, for those who might not be familiar with it, it it's, uh, it's got a better inter interactive experience with the command line for, you know, horizontal paging. It's got uh, IntelliSense autocomplete. It's got uh, command history. Uh, it basically handles large result sets much better. It's just a, a much more modern approach toward um, command line uh, interactive uh, experiences versus SQL CMD, which is, like I said, really tight on top of the driver. Like it's just, I'm gonna take your text and I'm gonna send it to the driver, right? It's not gonna do a lot for you as a user in between. But uh, though it demos well, yeah, we haven't seen the uptake in usage on it. And that could be a reflection of uh, people aren't using it interactively, they don't know about it. Uh, and so that's kind of a, an area that we're still you know, interested in. And so watch this space and we're watching this space. So moving up to notebooks, uh, notebooks are a concept that we added into uh, our tooling about two years ago. It's a concept that comes from data science and the data science world. And when we're talking about notebooks, I wanna be distinct here that we're talking about notebooks as a technology set, though we tend to only really use and demo the notebook viewer that we have in our graphical interface, they are actually distinct concepts. So the concept of a Jupyter notebook with a Jupyter server, with kernels, with uh, the IPYMB file format and the combination of markdown and, and executable code is something that is independent of and has a wide set of tooling around. And also in our graphical interfaces in support of our use of notebooks, we are trying to make a really excellent graphical inter, uh, interface for using notebooks. But when I'm talking about it here, I wanna be clear that notebooks are something that we're investing in on multiple fronts. So this is another one of my little slides that I put together to show um, the way that we're thinking about it. So with notebooks, we have these different work streams. You may have seen me again present this before, where I'm saying that a notebook as a concept of you know having uh, this technology with an IPYMB file 
can be used in a couple different ways. So we have it using it as a user experience uh, where the actual uh, main user interaction in, you know, instead of a wizard, you have a notebook. Uh, instead of a uh, docs page, you have a notebook. Um, and so we have as UX, we have documentation, we have this collaboration sense where you're making changes or you're sending them to someone else or, or multiple people are working together. Uh, we have data workflows where you're actually doing your traditional data science, data prep, uh, experimentation type work. And then what we call operational notebooks, which is an area that we're using a lot internally to Microsoft, where you're saying, I want to use notebooks as tests. I'm wanting to use it as something that can be run automatically, and then I can just pick up the results later. So uh, I'll talk about how, how that's working a little bit in, in terms of our uh, internal tooling here in just a moment. But for the moment, uh, I'd like to actually jump over to our first demo and, and go back to kind of what's what's the basics on, um, you know, what is a notebook? So let me get my back to my you know, base here. So we're here back in Azure Data Studio and I'm going to do a, a, a new query. And let's just, you know, connect here to my uh, local hostess instance. And I'm gonna do your traditional type of SQL query, select star from sys.databases. And let's, you know, if I was gonna share this with someone, maybe I'd add a comment, list of databases on the server. So let's say this was my, my basic troubleshooting kind of experience here. And then I run this on master. So I get my result set. And then if I hit save, you know, hit control S save, it's gonna say, hey, what do I wanna call this? Uh, I'm gonna put this back here in my demo folder and say uh, list databases. So, all right, I got that. And then I'm gonna close it. And then when I'm gonna open it back up here, all I've got is the actual query. So this is the way that we've been working in SSMS. This is the way we've been working all of this time. So if I take this same thing and change it over to a notebook, so here's an export as notebook functionality. What I've got is a little bit of a change. I've got this section of text. And so I'm gonna say, uh, let's make this into a heading and then say, this was last run on 20. And then I'm going to run this again against my local hostess. Run this. And then I, if I hit Control S save, again, do a list of databases. Now I can, well, my. Now I can take this and I can close these. And whenever I reopen my IPYMB file, I'm going to have the full context again. So I've still got the results. I've still got the ability to do everything I was able to do with the results. I can still save it as JSON. I can still show a chart. I can still export it to CSV. And so this is something I can then check in to my source control. In fact, you can see here, I've actually got it source controlled, uh, untracked uh, in my source control. Uh, and I can share with other people. So this is one of the kind of the fundamentals. And if you look at the IPYMB format, uh, if I reveal that in a file explorer, um, this, this is a very standard format. So we're viewing this in, in Azure Data Studio, but let me open it actually in, in Notepad. Uh, let's see, and show you kind of what the internals of these look like. So it's really just a JSON file. So I'm using Azure Data Studio, but other Readers of IPYMB formats, uh, including other viewers of notebooks, can inter interact with this. And that also includes things like um, automated tool sets. So we have tool sets like PanDoc, which is able to take these and change them into other file formats. We have things like Papermill, which is an open source concept for actually automating things and adding uh, uh, parameters. And we have lots of different options of things you can do once you've transitioned kind of from this .sql file that has no metadata around it to this notebook file that has all of this extra metadata in it about here's what here's what's executable here's what's a comment etc and then in addition we have the ability you know to to work in all the, these different languages so uh, one of the uh, areas that we've been working on lately in Azure Data Studio is adding more uh, data service support so 
one of the things that we've added recently at Ignite was support for uh, Azure Data Explorer. So here I've got my uh, samples database, I've got my, my tables, et cetera. And uh, let me kind of show you an example of a query against that. So I'll go to my Custo notebook here. Custo and Azure Data Explorer being the same thing. Switch this over to Custo, and then I'll change my connection here to my Custo and change the database over to my samples database. And so now I have the ability to work within Azure Data Studio in this other language. So I'll, I'll run this and, and you can see, you know, it's really rerunning something that was already there, but you can see that um, we have the ability to run in the Custo language. I'm not sure why I'm getting my uh, little red lines squigglies here. I guess my IntelliSense is, is running a little off right now, but you get the, the general sense that we're able to move from language to language within basically the same uh, interface. So you're not having to learn some entirely new concept. Maybe you're having to learn a new language uh, to work in here, but you're not having to say, okay, now let's go from tool to tool to tool. Um, e even though if you wanted to, you could then take this and go work on it in Visual Studio Code, or you could work in, on it in some other language, or in some other interface based on the fact that there's a kernel here. Now, one of the things that we've been using this for a lot, uh, and this all kind of connects together, is uh, we've been trying to make this something that is really usable for uh, people who are doing troubleshooting experiences. And a lot of them, you know, they might be really familiar with um, the language of their choice, you know, in, in our user case often being SQL, but they're not as familiar with some of the other kind of code-like things. Like for example, as I'm going to edit this, um, let me see if I can hide my little thumbnails here working in the Markdown language. So this is, Markdown is something that people use a lot whenever they're in GitHub, et cetera, and maybe they're familiar with it, but a lot of our users were finding weren't. So we had switched in and made it where you can go in here and I can uh, change my, my bold here, you know, by typing it in, but or I guess that was italics. And see, even I don't remember, people have to kind of print out lists of things. And that's not something that was was landing really well with people. So one of the big changes that we've made, we, we're honestly updating notebooks very, very often, but one of the major changes that we've been working on is um, the uh, ability for users to easily make these changes in uh, Markdown. So I want to give you some a little quick tour of some of those things that we're doing. So uh, one of the key things that we've found is that people were wanting to copy things in from other locations. So I'm gonna go over here to my uh, docs page and I've got my you know, quick start using Azure Data to connect and query SQL Server. So I wanna say, I want to give someone in information about how to uh, you know, connect to a SQL Server. So I'm gonna select here and scroll down, copy this, and then I'm gonna copy Alt tab over here, add text, paste it there. And now it's pasted directly in without me having to make a change to it. Uh, it's, or it's already written it in Markdown. Now, if I was wanting to do something like this, where I've got a combination of code and uh, uh, text, I'll paste that in. And then I'm going to add another code cell. Take that, copy it paste that in and then let's add another text cell and we'll go ahead and grab that image and paste it in there. So from, from a usability standpoint, this is a lot faster than what we, we people were doing before where they were having to take this content and they were having to write it in Markdown, et cetera. So now we have basically this ability to, you know, I can now set a connection, run this tutorial, et cetera. We are looking at ways of even making this the documentation. Uh, and so I'll, I'll actually show you a little bit of that in a moment. So that's that's one level of it. So let's do a, another new one. Uh, um, really quick, Vicki, I think some yes. people are uh, having a little bit of trouble reading the text on your screen. Can we I will make it bigger. <laughs> Showing off another feature in Azure. Yes, doing. so uh, you hit control plus to make it bigger. So I, I uh, apologize, I will work at about that size. Please let me know if, if this is not uh, big enough here. So I'm going to show you a, a little bit more of kind of the, the little uh, fun tricks that we can do with, with this new WYSIWYG uh, ability we have here. So I just literally this week uh, adopted a new dog and he's an Australian Shepherd. Uh, and so I'm gonna go over here and take a little cute image of an Australian Shepherd 
and I can paste that directly in. And then uh, I can also, you know, let's say I was actually trying to do a write up on how this uh, uh, experience went, you know, at, at pass. I can go over to my slide deck and let's say, oh, here, this is pretty good. I'm going to copy this slide that we've been talking about and I'm going to paste that directly in. So you can see we've got some, some nice things here. And one of the areas we've spent actually a huge amount of time is getting people to be able to copy from OneNote. <coughs> because it turns out in a lot of environments, OneNote is where people were putting a lot of their runbooks. And when I say in a lot of environments, I absolutely include SQL Server in that. Uh, Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how, uh, how that's been going? <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. And, and actually, it came uh, out of a meeting. We were doing a review. Uh, the product group was doing a review with Rohan, actually, on progress and how things were going. And the, the engineering topic uh, was Azure Data Studio specifically. And actually, De Vicky did some of these awesome demos and showed in uh, I, I can't don't don't quote me exactly, but ba basically the paraphrase was that's amazing. Why don't my live site engineers and the rest of the SQL engineers have tools like this? And literally, that was the uh, catalyst that got us thinking. Hmm, that's a great question, Rohan. And so we we took that and really parlayed it into we really should because, as Vicky said, the state of the art uh, in SQL. I, I have to admit was. Uh, I would say, and the maturity model, if you're familiar with maturity models, most folks probably at least a little bit, on a knowledge management side was very, very low. Uh, and we literally have scratch pad like content uh, in OneNote and to the tune of thousands of OneNote pages for supporting uh, Azure SQL DB and uh, MI, VM, all of the, all of the uh, uh, systems. And that's mostly because the team wasn't very well versed in how to, to do that. And OneNote is super easy to create content and, it's, uh, and it syncs and shares pretty well. And that just became the state of the art. Uh, for the team. And of course, anybody that's familiar with that space at all quickly knows that you're not really maturing your content either and managing your content there. And uh, so that really became uh, two things coming together for us as an opportunity to say, well, we can be, bring a better experience, but we can also take this content, uh, a concept of run books and curating that knowledge and provide source control. We can provide uh, code review like workflows, but we could also move into this idea of being able to execute um, these notebooks rather than copy paste, which again, the state of the art was a one note would have a sample query. The uh, life site engineer would copy that over or sometimes craft manually craft a command line, fill in just really amazingly long parameters. Uh, and, and that's where we saw that opportunity. Uh, and we had a proof point to try and sell the entire SQL DB team on, which I think is what Vicky's showing here. It's just, we shipped with the big data clusters, uh, quite a large number of uh, notebooks built in uh, when we when you get this extension in Azure Data Studio to support big data clusters. This is the first time we've shipped such a complicated system as a SQL Server product. Uh, not that SQL is trivial, but when you look at what ships in big data cluster, there's a ton of internal services and complexity there. And so we quickly, as we were going through that release process, identified that people are going to need built-in support, run book capability, the ability to have all of this knowledge captured in a way that that not only could they go and read, but they could actually leverage. And so there's a ton of things in there. There's even Canary notebooks, which touched on some of Vicky's idea of operationalizing a notebook. Um, but that really became a, a, an opportunity for us. And now I think, Vicky, we're going to talk a little more about LiveSite uh, and kind of where that project's going in a little bit. You know, the difference between a good question and a great question is that the great question is that's the next slide. So oh, yes, okay yes, that so, is what we're going to talk about. So, yeah, so it's, I think it, you'll see it's uh, it's turned into quite a project for us. And I, I, I'd probably just finish up real quick on this with most of those features that you saw there, which I don't know any other notebook renderer. And this again to Vicky's point about separation of the presentation layer and the UI you're interacting with and the tech behind it. We've invested quite a bit in Azure Data Studio to make it almost seamless to transition from OneNote to editing and typing. And that's really come uh, 
from interacting with all those Azure data, uh, sorry, Azure SQL DB uh, lifesite engineers that had a very lightweight system and they don't want to turn it into a heavyweight system. They don't want to learn Markdown. They want to be able to copy paste. And that's one of the great things about using something like Azure Data Studio is that then we bring that into a tool that ships for everybody in the SQL community and helps us bring a first class tool both internally and externally. And it's really that, that inner loop that we have now there is driving a lot of work very quickly, but still accruing to, I think, one of the best notebook rendering and editing experiences that you can find anywhere on top of Jupyter Notebook Technologies. You're muted, Vicky. No. Oh, I think your microphone your microphone sounds very far away. You got super quiet. <laughs> very faint. How's that? Is that better? Getting there, maybe a little. How about that? More and more? Oh, that's better. better. better? OK, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So that automatically adjusts. Yeah, it automatically adjusted, and I got I was breathing too quiet or something. <laughs> Sorry. So but yeah, the, the whole purpose of us talking about this thing that which really is what's our internal thing, you know, why, why does an external uh, team uh, you know, care to hear about it. And it's basically to let you know that we are really all in on this technology stack. And as we are learning more about it and using it, we are then able to kind of come out with confidence to say, this is an area that is here that we're going to keep working on and that we think is going to have real value for any organization that is working with complex systems and complex data. And so as we're using it and kind of, you know, using it as our, the term, you know, eating our own dog food here, um, we're learning about it, we're going to be sharing what we learn and we're going to be doing things like uh, creating ways to operationalize and take these, um, these run books and turn them into tests and turn them into to end to end systems. So yeah, to go back to the, uh, the slide deck, uh, these are some statistics uh, as of uh, you know this week in terms of the number of troubleshooters that we're running. And these are all running in Azure Data Studio. So we have 12,000 notebooks, uh, we have 4.5 uh, thousand of them that are being used actively per, per month. And we have 25 different services within Azure who are now using it. So to give you some sense of like, you know, Azure Data Studio is able to scale up to running this many, but also just the concept of notebooks is, is spreading out quite, quite widely. So uh, that's kind of the state of notebooks as, uh, and we're gonna continue to work on additional kernels, additional languages, additional uh, inter integrations beyond Azure Data Studio into different open source technologies and really want to hopefully pull you along on, on that journey. So next we get to talking about, you know, the, the, the cherry on top for all of these things, which is the graphical interfaces. And so even though I was demoing uh, in Azure Data Studio this whole time, we have this entire set, set of graphical interfaces in addition to Azure Data Studio. Uh, that are worth mentioning and which all have their own valuable space uh, in, in the portfolio. So for the SQL client tools, uh, what I'm calling SQL client tools, SSMS and Azure Data Studio, as we'll talk about in just a moment, Azure Data Studio is beginning to, to become more of a data client tool and not so much a SQL client tool, but you know, I'd say for this, this purpose, I'll call them both SQL client tools. We have the Azure portal, which is uh, of course critically important for everyone who is working within Azure to have that web-based experience and all of the provisioning and, and resource management uh, experience with that. And then we have the developer tooling stack, which is uh, the SQL experiences within Visual Studio and also in VS Code. So the MS SQL extension in VS Code is, is actually a very widely used uh, extension with uh, many hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, and in Visual Studio, uh, the what had been SSDT is now uh, SQL projects in Visual Studio. It is also very widely used and is supported by this team. Uh, within the SQL client tools, because this is uh, after all a data conference, um, the, the differentiation between SSMS and Azure Data Studio 
is changing from year to year. I think when we first announced Azure Data Studio GA, we talked about how Azure Data Studio was a little bit more aligned to the, the dev and query editing experiences with more of the um, management experiences being aligned to the SSMS user. Practically speaking, that has kind of remained the same because a lot of the management experiences have not been moved over from SSMS to Azure Data Studio, things like the ability to set up um, availability groups, et cetera, are remaining in SSMS. But it's the way that it's kind of pushing a, apart from each other is less around those um, users and, and more around kind of this concept of SSMS being Windows only and SQL only, and really for the, the SQL focused work and Azure Data Studio being multi-OS, multi-data platform, uh, multi-cloud, uh, where you can work with SQL Server, you can work with PostgreSQL, you can work with Custo. Uh, we're working on bringing in um, really most of the rest of Azure Data is in some sort of connection with us internally to, to bring an experience into that. Um, the release cadence is not as different as you might think. So Azure Data Studio, it's released monthly, which is quite, quite often, uh, but SSMS releases, also much faster than it used to. So any uh, belief that there might be that SSMS is, is on the downswing, understand that it is actually releasing more now than it was before uh, when we had Azure Data Studio just from the nature of, of doing regular maintenance and bug fixes. But the net new experiences in uh, like things like notebooks that we're doing fresh and new are landing in Azure Data Studio, not in SSMS. And that's, that's practically necessary uh, for a lot of different reasons. So when we do something like a notebook experience, in the current world, we want it to be something that works on Windows and on Mac and on Linux. We want it to be something that will work across different data platforms. We want to have that sort of um, richness spread across as wide as we can. And when we put something net new into SSMS, it is still SQL Server only and Windows only. And so from a practical standpoint, we're needing to make some changes to the way that we develop SSMS and Azure Data Studio to help us to keep SSMS alive and vital for everyone who relies on it, as well as getting access to those net new experiences and not feeling this kind of back and forth. So one of the changes that we made in SSMS 18.7 was to start shipping Azure Data Studio with SSMS. And so um, kind of wanted to give this, this a little bit of time to talk about that and give some context for what is happening. Uh, I think that that landed at first as, oh, we're just trying to force people to move Azure Data to Azure Data Studio. But it, it is actually, if anything, the opposite of that. We're trying to make sure that new experiences that land in Azure Data Studio are more or less transparently available to SSMS users without them having no access to that new work that is happening in Azure Data Studio. So Ken, I, if you would uh, like to talk a little bit about the SSMS kind of design here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so as uh, most folks probably know SSMS actually was kind of the, uh, the, I think we started in 2002 or three, but it was the place where we decided to combine all the experiences for SQL uh, from kind of a query tool and an admin tool into a single tool. And uh, we learned an important principle back then, which is we really shouldn't be in the shell business, the, the kind of the core windowing, core uh, menuing, extensibility thing that, that we really needed even back in the early 2000s, which I'd say wasn't the height yet of collaboration in Microsoft. We still had a long way to go, uh, but it wasn't, it, it was just such an obvious choice to say, we need to build on top of somebody, uh, really the Visual Studio in our case, place where it made a ton of sense. And so we were able to leverage a lot. And we brought us, you guys, uh, or most folks probably have seen uh, a ton of features into SSMS over the years. And its boundary, as Vicky said, is Windows only. And it's very, very uh, high performance. We used to have, I, I, I like to share this because it helps people understand why SSMS is important, but also why it doesn't quickly move to open source or why we don't just move everything to Azure Data Studio and so. But we used to have a hundred engineers working on SSMS and SMO, and that included a team in India. And that was a very large team and they got a lot of work done and a lot of very custom work. So the editor itself has, I mean, even the, the data grid there is every, literally every pixel drawn in that data grid is, is custom. The storage system underneath the, the, the editor is all custom work. So there was a ton of work in detail around SQL data types, the size of those data types, the performance to do large presets. So we did a lot of that and we built all that into SMS and that's 
still, as Vicky said, very important IP, just as we still ship SQL Server on-prem. It's still a very important IP to the company. It's maybe not the same green or, or blank canvas of innovation that you're seeing in the cloud or what you're seeing in Azure Data Studio, but we're very much committed to making sure that that's, that, that tool is there for people to use. And it's the only place where you still get the experience that provides the AS, I, uh, SSIS and SQL server experiences together. And that's still very important to us. And I think that's one of those things where we saw that as an important evolution in kind of the identity of Azure Data Studio. As those might remember, it was originally called uh, SQL Operations Studio, I think <laughs> it was the original name. Um, and so we had a little bit of like, what is this thing going to be when it's grow up? What's the real strategy here? How does it make sense? And as, as we, you know, as, as anybody, we learned as we went, as we saw what the technology was capable of and really kind of where some of the gaps were. And as you see the innovation in the Azure Data Platform, you see there was this natural uh, affinity that or a, a natural uh, um, ability for us to bring the two together as complementary rather than as competitive or to have some, uh, some sense of one, you know, having to be in one or the other. And so as Vicky said, we've worked to try to bring together features and following really the precedent that SSMS already had around, if you want to go to Profiler, well, we didn't embed Profiler in a doc window inside of SSMS. We said, well, that's really a rich enough experience that you really shell out into a different app. Same thing with Database Tuning Advisor and some other tools that ship with SSMS. So we've decided that's actually exactly what we're going to do when we take Azure Data Studio, because the, 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 I think the strategic direction we've started to take that is, the, the data platform is evolving very quickly in the cloud. And that's why the Azure Data Studio name starts to make more and more sense as you see us roll these out, is it is about all bringing data together on the platform and this hybrid world. So it gives you integration from your existing SSMS domain and where you have those experiences into features that work much better and are optimized more for this hybrid world or, or different parts of the data platform as Vicky showed, even different data services, but you don't wanna completely leave your, the experience that you know or the, the, the other uh, thing, you'll see us do more integration over time between different data services too. So you'll see those things all come together. And so that portfolio starts to make a lot more sense when you look at it that way. And that was really kind of one of, uh, I think one of the great things Vicky brought was to the team was let's let's not look at those as competitive things, but let's see this and bring it to, to customers as a value add and really work on integrating those. And, and I'm sure that there'll be uh, lots of feedback on those and how we can make it better. And it might need to be tweaked one way or another for folks. But, but I think uh, what we're already seeing is that this helps us bring the strategy, a more cohesive strategy together for the tools. Yeah, and so I actually want to show you a little bit of a demo on that to kind of give you some product truth to that. So I'm going to pull up SSMS here. And this is um, one of the things to know is that, you know, with SSMS in uh, versions prior to 18.7, we didn't require Azure Data Studio. So what we did is when we have an integration, we put it in right here under this Azure Data Studio menu. And you can say, hey, new notebook. And it's going to open, you know, my Azure Data Studio over here and create a new notebook in context to the uh, the, the server here that I was connected to there. So let's say I've got a connection, I'm able to do this. This is a pretty light, lightweight connection. And you might think, why would we be shipping Azure Data Studio just to enable this? Well, it's kind of the other way around. We couldn't enable deeper, richer integrations than, than these kind of handoff experiences whenever we weren't also installing Azure Data Studio together. So I want to show you it going the other direction. So if I'm over here in, in SSMS and I go to the properties window, this is you know one of the very widely used uh, windows in, in uh, um, SSMS and over in Azure Data Studio, I can actually, let me go back over to my insiders one where I've got everything installed. My insiders, this is my insiders. Uh, I'm going to hit properties and it's actually gonna pull up the same window. Uh, 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 uh. Maybe oh, there it went. And so this this is pulling up, you know, an integration from Azure Data Studio to SSMS, and you can see it's not bringing up SSMS and creating the full frame and doing the whole shell and then happening to get into this. It's going to just bring this up directly. So 
if I go over to, uh, let's see, I think we've also got it at this level, go to uh, properties, uh, let's see if it wants to launch a little faster here. And this is, you know, this is the reality. Whenever you're launching from Azure Data Studio into SSMS, SSMS is, is a uh, big tool. It takes a moment. But the hope is that as uh, some of the features in Azure Data Studio, uh, like let's say the uh, some of these other data tier application wizards, things like that, these that are existing wizards in Azure Data Studio could be launched in the same way from SSMS. And you would get that sense, you know, if you're opening a SQL agent in here, uh, it actually is, uh, yeah, 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 not running. Uh, if you open Agent, everybody probably knows how it looks, it pops up a modeless dialogue window. That modeless dialogue window could be coming from something like SQL Agent.exe, it could be coming from SSMS.exe, or now with Azure Data Studio and shipping in there, that could be coming from Azure Data Studio.exe. So that's, that's the notion here, and I just kind of wanted to show you some of the product truth and tell you that we're laying this groundwork as we move faster and faster with experiences here in Azure Data Studio to make sure that those experiences do land here in SSMS where people are doing their other vital work and not having to you know, change uh, tools midstream whenever they, uh, they're, you know, got a workflow that works for them. So um, next up, uh, I want to be aware of time. We have about five minutes left. So I just want to go relatively quickly through some uh, discussion about the speed at which we are moving in Azure Data Studio. And then I want to show, let's see if I can get it done. I want to show the SQL database projects and I want to show a little bit on the Azure Data, uh, on the Azure portal. So maybe we'll go a tiny bit over. So I'd say start getting your questions into the chat so that Alan can start asking them of us uh, here in about five minutes. So here's a list of the Azure Data Studio features that we actually shipped in the last 12 months. Uh, and I updated this uh, a couple days ago, and this will be changing later this week. So this changes uh, very, very rapidly. Um, and uh, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the, the flow at which, you know, how we uh, release things. So Ken, do you want to talk about this? Should I, should I, should I go over it a little bit? Um, sure, I'll just be real brief because, as you mentioned, uh, we both are really good at talking. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we're good speakers, but we're really good at talking. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so real quick, I just really wanted to call one thing out, uh, and that's we've uh, recently made the decision to go and spend a little less time on some of the new features. So you saw that slide real briefly on the number of things we shipped in Azure Data Studio, and the team's been working really, uh, and even in, with the environment that we've been working in, we're all very fortunate to still be able to work uh, remotely, but uh, even with that, the team has still turned out tons of uh, new capabilities. The downside of that is that, uh, and just to be fully transparent, we're not doing enough bug fixing. Uh, I'm not completely happy with the test coverage and some of the other fundamentals we have, some of the tracing and diagnosability we have. Uh, we've had to tell customers we can't repro, which I consider uh, one of the worst customer satisfaction uh, things we can do. So we're gonna slow down a little bit in our rhythm and really optimize around, as Vicky's pointed out down on the, along the bottom, we have key events that typically drive some of those announcements and things, innovations in the platform that we want to align with. But we're going to take a couple of months each semester, semester being six months for us. We're going to take a couple months and really focus on bug fixes that we get reports from you. We want to fix more of those bugs. We want to be able to finish things that we start. We have some preview features that have been in preview uh, almost the entire lifetime of the, of the tool. So we need to get some of those things done. And then internally on the fundamentals and engineering side, again, I just, I want to see better tests. Uh, again, full transparency, we've shipped too many hot fixes where we've had to ship a release and then within a week we shipped a, a hot fix. And to me, that's again, a KPI that's uh, something we want to look, we look at very closely and it's just unacceptable to have that many hot fixes need to be rolled out. So we're going to find a better balance there with the team and really give them an opportunity to, I'd say, uh, finish what we start a little bit better, do a little bit of quality and stuff. So that's kind of what really is the highlight here. Uh, we'll still be doing monthly releases. You'll just see the content pivot uh, in those, uh, I don't know what color that is, the stabilization color. Um, and, uh, and those uh, releases will be a little more focused on things like bug fixes and things. So hopefully we don't continue or perpetuate uh, what I've heard many people say is the old connect or user feedback problem of I just, I send something and nobody does anything because for uh, for this we really want to do a better job on that front. Yeah, and and 
just a reminder that as you see these features coming in, sometimes they'll be coming into the insiders. And so even whenever we start feature work, it might not be graduating up to the stable monthly release until a little bit later. So do not take any changes to this as being an indicator that we're doing less work. We're just going to be kind of pivoting the type of work. So I'm going to very rapidly do uh, uh, two very fast demos just to kind of show you uh, some of the things that I wanted to be sure to uh, get out to you as, as new updates. So one of the critical things that we've added in Azure Data Studio recently, and this is kind of looking at the cross-platform story for Azure Data Studio, is bringing in a SQL database projects. So now I'm able to go into here and say, uh, create project from database. And I'll be able to step through a process of actually extracting a SQL database project from an existing database. Uh, I can also create fresh ones or I can bring them in from Visual Studio. And here, for example, I have uh, worldwide importers. I can go and I can see my, my tables all listed out here. And then I can do a live schema compares from that. So let me do a schema compare from that. Uh, it's going to build my project here for just a second. And I'll be able to compare this either to a DAC pack or to a live uh, database uh, to see what changes that I've made. And so those changes, uh, I can actually kind of uh, preview them here. I have them over here in source control. So I can go over here and see uh, over on my customers.sql file, uh, I've changed, uh, made a change here in that I've added, let me see, uh, pronouns uh, to my customer. So I've added this new pronoun field. And now over here in my schema compare, I can hide this. I can then compare to a database. I'll compare it to my local uh, wide world importers and then let it do its comparison. And I can see you know, what changes are uh, happening here. And then I can actually apply just those changes by hitting the apply button once it finishes up there. So if you're a user of SQL database projects in Visual Studio, uh, this gives you a now a cross-platform option that you can use on uh, Mac and on Linux. If you have maybe not been looking at SQL database projects because you've been mostly an SSMS user and that's something that's off in Visual Studio, this might be a good opportunity to revisit this technology, see if it's something that would work for you and, and would you know, help you get your, your work done. Uh, we have some really great videos out there that get you know, run through the end to end on this. And so for the sake of you know, uh, not uh, delaying on it, I'll, I'll maybe come back to this in a moment. And I just wanna talk a little, little, little tiny bit about the uh, SQL portal. So the primary thing we're trying to do in the Azure portal is modernize uh, the experience and make it consistent and accessible. So modernization has to do with the look and feel. Consistency has to do with making it more about one SQL server across you know, Azure SQL DB, Azure SQL Managed Instance, SQL uh, Server on Azure VMs, and then accessible in terms of being available to people of all different uh, levels of ability. So I have an example of a design. This is an example of an old design where the old Azure portal had this concept where you would kind of click on here and then it kind of kept adding blades off to the right. And here's another one where it kind of has here and it, the look of it and the, the amount that you could fit into these little thin skinny blades uh, wasn't great. And so we still have some of these that exist, but where we're modernizing it, we have something that looks a little bit more like this, where we're using the full screen. We have the ability to see what the next step is going to be and to quickly move through it. So this is something that you'll find is also a little bit more visually in line with what you'd expect in a client tool. And that is by design as well. The other thing that we're doing is trying to create a consistency uh, across the Azure SQL portfolio. So here I've got, uh, you see here, I've got Azure SQL. Previously, you would go to SQL databases and you'd see SQL databases and they'd be separate from SQL managed instance and SQL managed instance on Azure Arc and SQL virtual machines, all separate. But now we've added this concept of Azure SQL in the portal where whenever I go to add a new uh, experience, uh, it will help me walk through which of the different varieties of SQL server that I want to uh, use. And I can hit show details to see what the difference is amongst them. So once you go down into this experience, there's a lot of consistency as well as far as the order of the things that it will be asking you to do so that you don't have such a, a large learning curve between these different flavors of what is really the same product. And we're starting with Azure SQL. This is a very widely used experience uh, in Azure. It's one of the most highly used experiences. And we're going to be trying to kind of push this concept out even further and see if, what additional consistency we can get across all of Azure data. So that's just kind of a sense of what we're doing in the Azure portal. And so now with a, you know, 
uh, negative four minutes to go. I think it's time for us to, to go over to questions. So Alan, do you have any for us? Looking for unmute button. Okay, um, so there's one that has several upvotes here. So um, some scripting options like create or alter were not updated in SMO like they are in SSMS. Would SMO come up to date sometime with same scripting options as SSMS? Uh, okay, that's. Uh, I'll have to follow up on that one because yeah. I think uh, for the most part, the scripting support in SSMS is done via SMO. There may be some uh, corner cases there, but uh, actually, if we can get a little more detail on specifically which ones, uh, it may just be a bug in what's out in the SMO NuGet library versus what shipped in a given release with SSMS. But but definitely, let's follow up with that one uh, on the specifics because they they should be the same tech. You can uh, send that feedback either to us via the SQL feedback on uh, user voice, or you can hit us up on Twitter, or I have our email addresses listed here as well. All right, another question is just, uh, I, saw, I saw this question several times uh, about future data support. So things like MySQL and MongoDB and things like that. Uh, what, what's our official stance on that? And where, where can users go to request these? So uh, when you want to request a new updates, uh, I'll actually page over to this and kind of show you how to do it. You go to the uh, Azure Data Studio, uh, uh, Azure Data Studio issues. Um, let me log into my single sign on here. Uh, and then what you want to do is either uh, search for it and upvote it, or you want to uh, request it. So let me put MySQL in here. And then we can see we have a request for data DB2 and we have a database support for MySQL. So what I can do here is having looked at that, if that's the one that I'm interested in, uh, you want to hit this up button here, or this little thumbs up. You can see that we've got about 1120 thumbs up on that. And so I feel pretty comfortable. I've, I've mentioned this elsewhere. We are working on MySQL. We actually have a working version of it. We just don't have it out for preview yet. Uh, MySQL and MariaDB uh, are, are coming fairly eminently, Kusto uh, Azure Data Explorer has recently come out. And so it's going to have the Kusto flavored data services like Log Analytics should be coming along uh, as well. We're in engagements uh, to talk to Synapse and to uh, Cosmos DB about bringing in some experiences on that. So as we're working through it, we'll probably hit all of the Azure branded ones. And then for some of those other ones, uh, you know, maybe outside of the Azure Data, uh, you know, close circle, we're having conversations about maybe a generic ODBC connection or something like that that would allow you to connect to other data services that we don't maybe have as specific uh, of a relationship with. Uh, I'd really be interested in hearing more about what those other services might be though. Uh, thanks, Vicki. There's another question on how does Azure Data Studio compare to the Visual Studio DB projects and DB compare performance or scalable for larger DB schemas? So the uh, Azure Data Studio fundamentally uses the same DACFX engine for uh, Visual Studio and for uh, uh, Azure Data Studio. Ken, I'm not sure that I would say that there's any real performance differences um, there except at the UI level. What, what would you say? Yeah, actually there's, uh, so, so one of the biggest differences actually is that uh, the DACFX that's used by SSDT is, the, is still on full framework. The one that's shipping in Azure Data Studio uh, is on .NET Core. And in fact, we just, just recently are working on several performance improvements there. Um, there. You'll see more investment, I think, there. And it's actually similar without the namespace change that we talked about with the driver. But it's a similar type of thing where you'll see um, we, we're, we're not going to invest anymore on the old .NET framework version. Uh, what we are going to see us do is invest in the .NET core version, just because that accrues, you know, the same work accrues to multiple uh, uh, products and multiple uh, platforms. So, uh, but that there is probably some, we don't have any good performance numbers to share right now uh, publicly yet because we don't, we don't have a really good con controlled set of tests and things that would stand up to that kind of uh, publication yet. But, but it is an area that we've been looking at uh, and investing in. And, uh, and so I think you'll, you will see some, uh, we know that scalability of uh, uh, complex schema is definitely on the list. Uh, and then uh, we'd also like to see uh, 
um, better performance, even, you know, even for things in compare and stuff. But we also know that just if you use backpacks and so you're using kind of the import export stuff, there's some significant uh, performance issues at larger scale databases, obviously. So that's something we're also working with some interesting innovations in the engine that hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to share a little more, but, uh, but know that that's kind of the place where you'll probably see most of that. Uh, come along and uh, and again, if there's significant changes in the capabilities of DAC effects, they'll mostly be on the, the .NET Core version, which is available for uh, other folks via the NuGet package or uh, obviously the experience that you get inside a, a Azure Studio. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Um, are there, how many more questions can we take at this point? Uh, I would say we've got about five more minutes. Oh, okay. That's plenty of time. Perfect. Um, so there's another uh, question here around, will we be able to group filter Azure portal to all kinds of SQL instead of having to select between all those different Azure DB products? Yes, actually, I, I slid right past that in my rush to get through. Uh, I will go back to my uh, demo here, which I guess I now closed. So let me go back to my portal.azure.com. Um, and the, it, the answer is yes. What you need to do is you need to go to the Azure SQL experiences rather than going to the experience for any of the individual services. So if you have been going into these services looking at, I, you know, I'm listing SQL DB, then, or, you know, I'm clicking on SQL databases, you're going to see your SQL databases. If you click on um, Azure SQL, or if you look at search it up here, uh, the experience you're going to get is going to be a combination of your Azure SQL products in lots of different locations. So let me actually change the subscription over to my demo one, which has a better list here. Demos. And so I've got uh, managed instance on Azure Arc. I've got SQL database. I've got SQL server on a VM. Uh, and so I'm able to see all of these together uh, whenever I'm looking at my uh, Azure SQL level. All right, uh, there's another question on, will there ever be direct web-based connectivity to SQL Server? So uh, I guess there's two ways of interpreting that. One would be, is there direct web-based connectivity for your applications, like REST APIs, et cetera? Uh, and that, that's kind of, um, I'd say, not something that I'd be looking into. That's not something that I'd say is in the kind of the tools and experiences level of, of uh, mandate, but in terms of, direct connectivity for your tooling experiences. Uh, there is a SQL editor in the Azure portal uh, and it has a certain number of experiences in it, but uh, for kind of the broader conversation about, hey, you know, what about uh, PolyCloud? What about Azure Arc? What about, you know, wanting to connect to um, uh, and do it all things you do in Azure Data Studio? We are looking at and, and working on web mode for Azure Data Studio. Uh, it's something that I have actually shown in a couple of focus groups, and so it's not exactly, you know, a, a top secret, but we don't have a, a, a strong plan yet on how that's going to get out there, but it's something that we're aware of as, as a desire for people to have kind of these um, headless experiences where they can just kind of use their browser and get started on uh, uh, working with their data platform without having to go and download tools and make sure that they have the right Python versions and make sure that everything is, is approved to be installed onto their machines. So it's an area of, of I, I'd say, very intense focus uh, in, within the team on, on how we best solve that. Ken, do you have any color you'd like to add to that? Oh, uh, well, uh, it really does depend on if the question was about kind of like TDS over HTTP, or is it about I want to have uh, web hosted tools. So I think you covered the web hosted tool side pretty good. We, we have a lot of tech that's uh, percolating. And as uh, Vicky was saying, there's there's some opportunities we can be looking at and how that'll pan out. Uh, I think we'll hopefully have plans in the not too distant future. Uh, as far as uh, actually connecting over HTTP directly to SQL Server, um, nothing really at this point uh, that I think would be considered a production level thing. We've toyed around for years just in SQL around, should we build a new HTTP endpoint for SQL for certain series? Edge 
obviously comes up as hmm, maybe that's a really good uh, use case for it. Um, just nothing that we can announce right now. And, and actually, as Vicky said, it really most likely wouldn't be done in our uh, product, part of the product would probably come out of a, a different uh, sister group. And so I think we'd have, uh, but as soon as we have it, we'll be happy to share because I think there'd be some interesting experiences that would also light up and that we would want to work with uh, with those teams on. As a kind of follow-up to that, uh, there's one question around, uh, is, is there any plans for tools in a, a code space environment? Plans is a, such a strong word. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're we are having those conversations. Uh, I don't have anything to share on that. Is is that one of those I can neither confirm or deny kind of comments? I can neither confirm nor deny uh, <laughs> that uh, I am familiar with Code Spaces concept and find it very exciting. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, I think we're at time. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, we are available, you know, we're both, all of us, Alan as well, I didn't list on here, very active on Twitter. So um, feel free to follow up with us uh, if you have any other side questions. And I'm going to also go and see if I can find the right chat room to, to hang out in uh, for a little bit and answer some other questions. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, and then just as a reminder, we do have uh, session evaluations. So if you could take a moment and do a session evaluation, people do actually take that quite seriously um, uh, within our org and within PASS. It really helps uh, the, the organization to make uh, a plan for next year. So thank you so much for your time. Yes, thanks everybody.